Christmas is coming. Uh, you may or may not realize that. Um, there's a tree in the corner. Uh, and you will be involved in all sorts of things. We're in the season of Advent, a season of preparation for the time when we especially remember the birth of the baby Jesus in that stable in Bethlehem. At least that's ostensibly what these next few weeks symbolize. But I, I rather suspect that worshipping Jesus is not the main focus of many people right now. Even those of us who acknowledge Jesus as our saviour. I mean, there's all the food to buy in, isn't there? The cards to write, the tree to purchase and to decorate. Has the letter to Santa been sent to the right address? Do we really have to put up with old Aunt Jemima on Christmas Day? So many preparations to make. 101 things crowd our minds. For children and young people, if they're anything like uh, my grandchildren, uh, it probably means writing a lengthy list to Santa Claus. So yes, uh, our grandchildren have been busily uh, sending us emails with all the things they'd like for Christmas. And of course, they give you the link so that you can <laughs> buy it online. For the, the parents, I guess uh, this season is nothing but stress. What will be your focus this Christmas? Or rather, who? will be your focus this Christmas. God spent many years preparing to send Jesus into our world, or rather, into his world. There are countless prophecies concerning his birth. Apparently, 350, uh, 351 Old Testament prophecies were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. I have to confess, I haven't checked to see whether that figure is correct. <laughs> and then Jesus spent three years preparing his disciples to embark on the process of building his church. And in today's passage, which we'll come to in a few moments, we'll get a glimpse of how he did it. Much of what I will be saying this morning is stuff you've heard before you know it if you've already given your life to Jesus. So this will simply serve as a reminder because I think I can safely say that many of you, just like me, have heard but don't believe that it could possibly apply to us, to me. Can it possibly be true for me. So, what are we talking about? Our text today opens with the amazing disclosure that Jesus invites us and equips us to participate in his mission. We've not had a Bible reading this morning because we're all going to read together at various points. It's just to check that you're still awake. So let's start with verse 1 of Matthew chapter 10. Jesus called the twelve disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out the impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. Authority to drive out spirits and to heal. Did you get that? As his children, we have authority too. Did Jesus command? Did he cajole? Did he threaten? No, he called. And his disciples chose to follow him. Following Jesus is a choice. The level at which we 
ourselves, give ourselves to him, that is a choice. He gives us authority. Do we use it? You see, God is a gentleman. He does not force himself on us. He does not demand that we love him. He does not insist that we follow him. He does not force us to grow deeper into him through the power of his Holy Spirit. He invites us. Our relationship with God, with Jesus, with the Holy Spirit, is exactly that. It's a relationship. It is our response to the love that he showered upon us. It is our love given in response to his love. John 10, 23, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching, said Jesus. John 10 and 15 to 17, if you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another comforter, an advocate to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth. So let's read on together. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, called Peter. Now we know the caliber of Jesus' early team, don't we? There was a GP, there was a headmaster, uh, there was a sound engineer, but he's not here this morning. Uh, there was an accountant, almost certainly a solicitor, a surveyor, all professional men of social standing. Were they heck? <laughs> they were very ordinary men. Fishermen whom I'm absolutely sure were adept at public speaking. A tax collector who was loved by the local people. A zealot. An ideal collection of candidates to build God's church. The point is, as Jamie often <coughs> quotes from uh, a guy called Smith Wigglesworth, God does not call those who are equipped, he equips those whom he has called. God does not call those who are equipped, he equips those whom he has called. And that's a sort of paraphrase of 1 Corinthians 1, as you'll see there. Yes, it's true. God calls, God equips, God uses very ordinary people. And that includes you. Now that's a surprise, isn't it? And me, goodness gracious. It includes you, whoever you are, male or female, young or old, educated or not, able-bodied or not, irrespective of the color of your skin, or your nationality at birth. Ordinary people like you and I. Up to this point in Matthew's Gospel, the narrative has been all about Jesus. The Sermon on the Mount, Jesus teaching the people, Jesus performing many miracles, the Pharisees asking Jesus questions, and so on. Possibly a year's training? But here in verse 5, the theory ends and the, tra the theory training ends and the practical training starts. Some of you have taken the driving test fairly recently, maybe, and you know that you have to pass the theory test before you can take the practical test. Let's read on. 
These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, freely, freely, freely give. See, I can't read, it's hopeless, isn't it? <clears throat> Can you remember back to verse 1? Jesus gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. And he sent them out. God sends us out too. <laughs> yes, we can argue that the disciples had Jesus with them all the time. But excuse me, Jesus is with us all the time. By his spirit within us. He lives within our hearts, as the children's song tells us. And note that Jesus gave his disciples a dual mission. Not a jewel that you put on your um, earrings or something like that, but a, a twofold mission to proclaim the message and to care for people, the sick, the dead even. Those were demons. And that instruction still applies today. We have a dual mission preaching and teaching, instructing and being the Good Samaritan, caring in our community. And we come on now to a bit that I find just a little bit challenging. So let's read on together. Do not get any gold or silver or copper or take with you belt, no bag for your journey or Whatever town or village you enter, search there for some worthy person and stay at their house until you leave. As you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it is not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. Truly, I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. Commentaries I've read indicate that Jesus may have meant his disciples were not to take any excess baggage with them for their journey, only the basic essentials. They were not to be encumbered by worldly possessions. I would suggest that that's quite a challenge for many of us. I mean, we live busy lives. We have many commitments. We have lifestyles to maintain or even improve. I mean, we do excellent work in our spheres, don't we? But all that stuff can hinder our effectiveness for the gospel. We can become so bogged down with all the pressures of living, that there's little time to devote to the kingdom. Do not get any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belts. The question for all of us is, what gold and silver and copper and extra baggage do we carry around? When we read that Jesus effectively said, go only where you are welcome, I don't think we really understand the significance of shaking the dust off your feet. So what did that mean in the culture of the day? The Jews would often shake the dust from their feet when they left a Gentile city to show their separation from the Gentile religions and practices. But if the disciples 
were to shake the dust of a Jewish town from their feet, it would show their separation from Jews who rejected the Messiah. I found the following quote helpful. Shaking the dust off one's feet conveys the same idea as our modern phrase, I wash my hands of it. Shaking the dust off your feet is a symbolic indication that you've done everything you can in a situation and therefore carry no further responsibility for it. In this scriptural example, Jesus was telling his disciples that they were to preach the gospel to everyone. Where they were received with joy, they should stay and teach. But where their message was rejected, they had no further responsibility. They were free to walk away with a clear conscience, knowing they had done all that they could. Shaking the dust off their feet was, in effect, saying that those who rejected God's truth would not be allowed to hinder the furtherance of the gospel. The dust of those cities would not be allowed to cling to the feet of God's messengers. There was a spiritual significance to a disciple of Jesus shaking the dust off his feet. It was a statement of finality about the people who had been given the truth and had rejected it. On their first missionary journey, Paul and Barnabas put Jesus' words into practice. They had been preaching in Pisidian Antioch, but some of the Jewish leaders in that city stirred up persecution against the missionaries and had them expelled from the region. Acts 13, 51. So they shook the dust off their feet as a warning to them and went on to Iconium. Antioch may not have accepted and welcomed the gospel as they should, but that didn't keep the messengers from spreading to other areas. Paul and Barnabas had done all they could there, and their responsibility was now no longer on their shoulders, but on the shoulders of those in Antioch. The apostles proclaimed truth boldly. Some had accepted it eagerly. Some had rejected it with violence. The apostles were not responsible for the level of acceptance only for their own obedience to God. So this is a dichotomy, isn't it? On the one hand, we're told to go to those in need, those in need of a saviour, as well as those in need of compassion. Yet we are to leave if we are unwelcome and shake the dust from our feet. I suspect that some of you, like me, really struggle to know how long you should lo sh how long you should show love and support to those who welcome us only for what they can get out of us. People who, in a sense, play the system of Christian goodwill. Where do we draw the line? How do we avoid feeling guilty because we know that Christians should consistently show love and compassion? You see, Jesus was not afraid to walk away. Jamie mentioned the rich young ruler a little bit earlier when Jesus, uh, who was told by Jesus what he needed to do to follow him. Did Jesus run after him? When he walked away? No, he didn't. But conversely, the door is always open, as we see from the parable of the lost or prodigal son. Personally, I find this one of the most difficult decisions in Christian service. But Jesus clearly gives us permission to wash our hands of someone or some situation where they reject him. 
He gives us permission to walk away without feeling guilty, without beating ourselves up. You see, life is too short. There's a harvest out there, and it's an, a big harvest, and it's ready and ripe. And we are the harvesters. We must not get ourselves bogged down in situations where Jesus is rejected. There's nothing the devil would love more than for us to get involved in a situation where there is no hope, as it were. It's hard. But that's the way Jesus played it. And that's what he taught his disciples. The final phrase in the reading we've just read is a salutary warning. Not to us, but to the people who reject the message of God. Truly, I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. So, in summary, what gold, silver, copper, extra baggage do we carry? God invites us. He doesn't command. Our relationship with God is just that, a relationship. God equips those that he calls. We have a dual mission, preaching and teaching and caring. God expects us to go. Where he is rejected, God gives us permission to wash our hands and walk away without feeling guilty. We're going to close in just a moment with a song that paraphrases part of today's Bible story. Freely, freely, you have received. Freely, freely, give. You have received freely. It's now our responsibility to give freely. Amen.